Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video and a great diagnostic top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today, we'll discuss 10 ways to enrich your quiet time. There's nothing better than beginning the day with God. Our Lord rose early to find a solitary place with His Father. David said, Early will I seek you. It's a really good idea to tune your instrument before you try to play it. But some of us have tried and failed at this too many times. How can we start well and continue well with a quiet time? Here are some helpful suggestions. Number one, be consistent. Uh, we might say easier said than done. But uh, I noticed uh, when I asked the question, how did Job hang in there through all those tough times? He tells us in chapter 23 and verse 12, I treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And if you realize, we don't find it real tough to uh, eat at least a couple times a day. So we ought to make a deal with our body. I'll give you physical food if uh, you give me the opportunity to have spiritual food because uh, we're not bodies. Our bodies are simply the vessels we live in, and uh, we make sure we look after our bodies, but we need to look after our souls. And number two, remove any obstacles before you start. It sounds like this one's gonna help with the first one. Right, I, I think it's good. Uh, if we do have a tendency to struggle with that, to uh, prepare the night before, Maybe you're gonna have a, a hot drink, um, have your favorite chair, uh, have your devotional ready, maybe a few pens and a notebook. But uh, think of it the night before so that when you get up, you're ready to roll. You don't have to start uh, staggering around looking for stuff in the morning. And um, spiritually, of course, uh, uh, every day is a fresh start. That's why God's done, done the arrangement this way. So when we get up in the morning, uh, we can, His mercies are new every morning and we can benefit from that. And so um, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so confessing it is just naming it, just being honest with him. And when we do that, we can clear uh, our hearts, clear the deck so it's blue sky all the way to heaven. And we're ready to begin to hear what the Lord has to say to us. Number three, Ask the Lord for an intimate sense of his presence. Right. Uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And, uh, you know, if possible, I would even say, think about singing the Lord a love song in the morning. Um, anything that draws my heart to him, uh, I think so often we uh, get into this idea that, um, that God is an idea. He's not a real person. And... Uh, when he got Abraham to offer his son, he says, now I know that you fear me. I say, wait a minute, didn't God already know that? Well, for the same reason that my wife likes to hear me say I love her, uh, I don't have to say, look, I told you the day of our wedding, and if it changes, I'll let you know. She likes to hear it. And, and God is a real person. He's not a machine. He's not a computer. And he loves to hear our voices. Number four. Think about using a devotional book each day. This is something to prime the pump. We don't want it to replace the Word of God, but um, Proverbs 27, 19 says, As in water a face reflects a face, so our hearts reflect one another. And so people who've been through similar experiences, and God has used them to communicate that. And I've got quite a stack of them here. Um, Bill McDonald's uh, One Day at a Time is used by a lot of people. Here's a series from uh, Precious Seed in, in England, day, the Day by Day series. They have a whole group of these. Uh, this one, uh, simple and, and direct and very biblical, the Come and Dine series from Everyday Publications. Uh, there are others. This is Jowett. I like his writings. Here's uh, Theodore Epp, Strength for the Journey. Daily devotional. Here's uh, Harry Arnside, the continual burnt offering, and uh, one of the old classics, Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. 
uh, devotional. So there are lots of them available. Get one that is biblical, that is uh, real and fresh, and uh, it's something just to help uh, move your heart, stimulate your heart, and give you some thoughts to uh, advance your own thinking regarding the Lord. Now, number five is one that revolutionized my quiet time, and that is to read the Word for thoughts, not necessarily a certain length of Scripture. Before, I would always read kind of almost like, check, did it, right? I, I read the, my chapter, read my three chapters, whatever it was, and then it was like, well, check. Instead, reading it to find a thought for the day, that, that became very meaningful. Yeah, if the objective is just to get through this book as soon as possible, that's a, that's a pretty poor objective. We want to meet the Lord as we're reading. We want him to speak to us. And so when we begin by asking that of the Lord, say, I want this intimate relationship, I want to hear your voice, as we begin to read, we're listening for that. And uh, we may read a couple of verses and come to something that, the Lord clearly speaks to us. It may take a few pages until we catch it, but yes, that's exactly what we should be looking for, not just a legalistic, I've, I've got something to be proud of because I've read this many chapters, but actually hearing God speak to us. Number six, have you heard of the paperclip method of Bible reading? What is this? <laughs> okay, well, you know, sometimes, uh, people begin to read through the Bible and uh, they do pretty well in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus is a little tougher and then Deuteronomy sounds like a fair bit of the uh, a sort of a reprise of what we've read. The same is true when we get to Kings and Chronicles. It's sort of like, hmm, Samuel and King sounds like it's repeated here. Uh, but sometimes we get into these genealogies and we get into some of these heavy passages and we slow down, slow down, slow down and stop. And so the idea behind the paperclip method is to realize that the Bible is arranged in subsections. And so if you have a paperclip for uh, the Pentateuch, and uh, on Monday you read a little section from the Pentateuch, and then you go over to the history books on Tuesday, and you read a little something from the history book. So five books in the Pentateuch, 12 books in the history books, and then you come to five books in the poetry section. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, have another paper clip there, another one for the prophets, another one for the gospels and acts, and then one for the epistles. And then as you go along, you see, um, you're bringing the whole scripture before your mind through the week. And pretty soon you start to see bone comes to bone. You say, hey, I think I read something over here about that. And you start to see correlations in different parts of the scripture. And it keeps you from having to go through some longer sections that kind of dishearten people. And you say, well, anybody can do anything for one day. So I can stick it out here in Chronicles because tomorrow I'm going to be in the Psalms. And before you know it, I'll be reading about Jesus in the Gospels. So uh, it has a disadvantage in that there is a, a, there's a good sense of reading through the Bible from beginning to end, but sometimes people just get disheartened in that process, and you might want to give that a try, the, the paperclip method. Number seven, <laughs> purpose in your heart for the day based on what God shows you. We read that Daniel purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat. And David made the Lord his habitation. That's the same word, same Hebrew word. He, he said, I'm going to stick with him all day long. I'm going to make a point of that. Um, Deuteronomy 32, 46, set your hearts. It's the same word. It's like setting the alarm clock. I remember T. Ernest Wilson, he told us the story how at 4 a.m. he would get up to study because um, he, he was a... Uh, a welder's helper assistant in the shipyards before he went as a missionary to Africa. And so he would rise early so he had his study. And one young person incredulous said, how did you ever do that? And so Mr. Wilson quietly said, well, I bought an alarm clock and I set it at four o'clock and I put it on the other side of the room. So I'd have to get up to turn it off. And uh, when the alarm went, I took my right hand and reached over my chest and firmly grasped the sheets. 
And then with one smooth movement, I pulled the sheets off my body, and then I swung my legs over the bed and put them on the cold floor, and that's how I did it. <laughs> so there's nothing magic about this. Uh, we just say, this is beneficial. I need this. This is more than my necessary food. And I'm going to purpose that when God shows me something in his word, that I'm going to look for an opportunity that day to put it into practice. Because Jesus didn't say, happy are you if you know it, but happy are you if you do it. So part of our prayer request is, Lord, now that you've shown me this truth, I want an opportunity today to plug it in. And if I miss it, please give me another one and another one until I get it. That really shows how this quiet time really can set that um, tone for, for the rest of mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. uh, number eight, keep a record of answered prayers. The psalmist says in the 103rd Psalm, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. One of the warnings the Lord gives to Israel when they're coming into the promised land is don't forget. When things are going well for you, you tend to forget. So don't forget, you can't afford to forget all the Lord's kindnesses to you. And when we're going through difficult times, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord has done. If we forget those things, um, we tend not to ask for more. When we, we remember them, say, look, the Lord did that for me. Well, then I'll ask him again. And so we're inspired to, uh, to keep coming before him and count our many blessings. The number nine, consider having different prayer lists for different days. I don't know about you, but um, I meet so many people and my list keep growing until eventually I think, well, I'm going to just not be able to do anything else in the day. And uh, so this is a suggestion. It's not the only one. There obviously will be certain things we pray for every day. But... Um, for having a different prayer list for each day of the week and, and say, even a little, a little booklet and say, on Monday I'm going to pray for missions and missionaries. And on Tuesday for tasks I have to do and for my ministry. And, uh, and for Wednesday I'm going to pray for the workers around me, the elders in my local church, the evangelists I know, the people here in my own locale. On Thursday I'm going to spend it in thanksgiving. I'm going to think about all the good things the Lord's done, and I'm going to lift my heart up in thanks. On Friday, I'll pray for family and friends, and maybe even some enemies. Throw those in, too, because we're supposed to pray for our enemies. And then on Saturday, I'm going to pray for sinners and, and the backsliders and uh, the wayward children, because uh, that's a good day to, for Christians to contact unbelievers and maybe to invite them along the next day to hear the gospel. And then maybe on Sunday, I'll pray for the saints and try to pray for all the Christians in my locale by whatever name they call themselves and to practice the truth of the one body. So it's an idea. It's, it doesn't, it's not, again, it's nothing legalistic about it, but it just helps, again, breaking the, the prayer list into manageable bits so that I can remember to pray. And then finally, number 10, share something you enjoyed with others. This is how it's multiplied, right? Proverbs 11.24 says, There's one who scatters and yet increases. There's one who withholds more than is right, and it leads to poverty. So if we withhold what we've enjoyed from the Word... Now, there are some things that are so intimate, we may not tell others. But there are always things the Lord gives us that we can share. I'll never forget preaching one Sunday, and there was a man in the audience, and he was taking notes. But they were quite unusual notes. And I was curious, and afterwards I went to see him, and I said, could I see your notes? And he smiled. He, he had pre-printed postcards, and if he heard something that he enjoyed, he'd jot it down on a card. And he'd put that card down, and he'd listen a while longer, and he'd catch something else he liked, and he'd put that down. When he got home, he'd send a little note to a college student, or a shut-in, or a missionary, and he would just say, I was out tonight, heard Brother Jabe Nicholson speak, he said this, I thought you'd appreciate it, I thought you'd enjoy it. And he would take the blessing of that one meeting and he'd scatter it all over. That's a great thing to do. So when the Lord shares something with me, he wants me to pass it on. You can get pre-printed Bible quote postcards, beautiful 
front cover with a Bible verse. And if you had a few of those, and uh, it, you know, the problem we don't do things is, well, you know, I've got to get a, a, an envelope, I've got to get a card, I've got to do this, get that. If you just had a little stack of those postcards, had a sweet idea, write it down, send it to somebody, and you're multiplying the blessing. You're sharing the cream that, uh, that you've enjoyed. <laughs>